Thank you, Mina. And um, thanks to the, uh, the Codex uh, Society and so on for, for having us. Um, I, I'm privileged to be able to speak following Ken because many of the things I'll talk to you about, uh, their future applications and the, the breadth and depth with which they will be deployed to treat patients is going to largely hinge upon the application of what Ken was speaking about to better understanding what every cell actually is delivering. It's actually delivering a, a complex array of genetic traits uh, and, a, and a basically a programming, programming language. So uh, my, our company, Cellularity, has been focused on the, the conversion of living cells into medicines. A stem cell, as you know, is a, is a single cell. We all, we all originate as a single cell created by a fertilization process, and that cell goes on to replicate itself and divide and specialize, differentiate into many of the different cell types of the body. The discovery of stem cells many years ago led to the concept that perhaps we could actually use these tools to treat diseases. Now, early on, and, and if I go back 25 years, I was a, I was a neurosurgeon taking care of head and spinal cord injury uh, in New York at, uh, at Cornell Medical Center. Um, the, the first papers I read about stem cells got me thinking, is this potentially a tool that would allow me to transform the, uh, the way we treat these patients who have tremendous functional deficits after brain or spinal cord injuries? And the original concept was that these cells were going to be able to, in essence, replace or plug the holes, if you will, that occur after injury or disease. The reality is today we recognize that, that by delivering cell therapy and augmenting or replenishing a reservoir of, of cells, stem cells that exist in every tissue of the body, we can restore functionality by, by putting back the, the master orchestrators of biologic functions. And these things wind up uh, uh, being related to uh, how every mature specialized cell in our body actually is a program delivery of a, pro a protein and synthetic repertoire, and it's the products of that synthesis that give rise, to, give rise to function. It's why a neuron behaves differently than a liver cell. Um, and that uh, in order to do this, the challenge in turning living cells into medicines was first understanding where could you get these cells in a reliable fashion that had the right biological properties and attributes that were clinically relevant and could you produce these to the scale and quality that the, that the healthcare system could adopt and it wouldn't break the bank? So if you think about it, that's a tremendous, tremendous set of requirements in order to turn cells into medicines. Uh, and we stumbled upon the fact that at a time when, when scientists were making most of the seminal discoveries in the leftovers of, uh, of, of an abortion, uh, or in, in embryos that were abandoned in IVF programs, that it dawned on me, and, and, and I often say, uh, every obstetrician out there should probably say to themselves, wow, uh, after delivering every baby, the leftover placenta goes into the wastebasket. That is nature's biological stem cell factory, and it turns out that, the, uh, that this organ is just a remarkable repository of everything you would need to service this, this emerging field of cellular medicine. So first and foremost, the placenta, as Bina was alluding to, has a very, very unique immunobiology. Bina mentioned that, that, that it's remarkable that a mother can carry a fetus and its placenta because the placenta is produced by the same fertilized, fertilized cell that gives rise to the embryo and ultimately the fetus. That placenta is a unique genotype that's encoded by contributions from the mother and the father, which means it's not a perfect match to the mother. However, she carries it for nine months and doesn't reject it. It doesn't reject the mother. But consider this, in surrogate pregnancy, a mother carries a fetus that's not even related to her. It doesn't even have any of the same genetic code that, uh, that would exist in her own body, yet she doesn't reject it, it doesn't reject her. That remarkable immunologic tolerance uh, capability is what makes this platform the best possible place to find cells to deliver as a therapeutic. Consider also the fact that in the world today, there's 130 million births that produce a placenta and the vast majority of these wind up becoming biological waste that has to be managed. 
you know, hospitals pay to get rid of placentas. And um, even in existing banking systems where stem cells are collected from birth and banked away, it's a fraction of a percentage which are actually utilized in one way or another. That's tragic in my mind when you consider the fact that if, that if there were transplantable kidneys made as available as this, we would find some way to capture them and put them into clinical use. But I'm here to tell you that, that our company, since inception, recognized that not only was this an abundant resource, but that we could actually use it to mass produce therapeutics. One placenta today in our hands can produce 100,000 doses of stem cells, which can be used to treat autoimmune disease, and now more recently, even cancer. So in order to do this, the, uh, the challenge was to, to create a system that would allow us to, in a, in a reliable, consistent, a regulatable manner, transfer the, the process of collecting placentas at birth into a highly organized procurement event where data is captured. That data has to be managed, and that's why the tools that Ken talked about are so valuable to our industry. And then from that procurement event, create a master cell bank that can be stored away, and stored away in, in, under conditions that in some cases provide it with an infinite lifespan. The, the, the ability to freeze a living cell and come back 50 years and, that, uh, and thaw that cell and it still has the same biological activity, that's a fact. That's not, that's not uh, uh, a theory. That actually is, in fact, what can, what can happen. And then from that master cell bank producing products that can give rise to uh, the treatment of autoimmune disease, and more recently, as you probably know, there's this emerging field of immunotherapy that takes immun immunologic cells like T lymphocytes and natural killer cells and then engineers them to target cancer, and it's one of the great breakthroughs in the management of cancer. Uh, Jim Allison just won the Nobel Prize for, uh, for his contributions to, uh, to immuno-oncology, and the cornerstone of immuno-oncology immuno today are immune cells. What better place to get immune cells than from the starting material that we get from the leftover placentas? Targets for cell therapy are almost limitless in the clinical realm. We can treat cardiovascular disease. We can uh, treat the degenerative neurologic processes that lead to Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's. As I mentioned to you, we can treat immunologic problems, dysfunction that's associated with infectious disease, or dysfunction that's associated with cancer. And, and what I'm really getting excited about is, the pro as, I'm, as I'm reaching my, uh, my uh, advanced years, uh, I think when I turned 60 and started getting more gray in my beard, I decided I was going to figure out some way to apply stem cells to treating age-related conditions. And one of the great things that, we're knowing, that we know right now is that, is that age-related symptom, symptoms that bother us are the ones that are associated with declining performance, okay? Declining mobility, declining cognitive performance, et cetera. And so I'm here to tell you that cell therapy Cell therapy is a cornerstone in all of these clinical areas. Now, some of this, some of this work uh, originated in a, a, a discussion that I had with the genomics pioneer Craig Venter, who you know for being the first to sequence the human genome. And Craig was beautiful at, um, and brilliant at describing that DNA is, in essence, a programming language and that uh, what exists in the nucleus of every cell is a software system. And that software system resides in the nucleus, is processed in the cytoplasm of the cell using, using methodologies which are not too different from what you find in computational devices. And the cell membrane actually acts like an I.O. system or a keyboard. And if you think about it that way, every stem cell can be thought of as a miniature computer that can deliver a full, intact, programmable system that, that is, can be used to change the synthetic repertoire of an individual, enhance it, or replace it. So about, uh, about 10 years ago, while, um, while uh, working at a company called Celgene, which is a highly regarded biopharmaceutical company in cancer and immunology, I took a look at some data coming out of some of our cancer trials at the level of stem cells in the bone marrow as a function of age. And this relationship was startling to me as well as a number of other investigators because we literally lose in an exponential fashion the quantity of stem cells in the various compartments of our body 
so that if you think about it, uh, in the bone marrow of a newborn, about one in every 10 to 20,000 cells is a stem cell, but in the bone marrow of an 80-year-old, it's one in 30 to 40 million. And so that difference in the quantity of stem cells, we related to the functional differences that occur with bone marrow with age, things that lead to cancers in bone marrow, things like myelodysplastic syndrome and multiple myeloma and so on. But what is this, what, is, what strikes you here? If it's just a quantitative change, why not just add new stem cells to the mix? Would that change the dynamic? And so years ago, we actually did the work and we actually collected stem cells from birth from experimental animals and gave them back to the animals as they aged. And what we found was that we could actually increase lifespan in those animals 40% from their litter mates, from their match control. Think about what that would translate to in humans, adding 40% longer lifespan. And I'm here to tell you also that not only did the animals live longer, but they were far stronger, uh, far more competitive. They had, they had maintained all of the functionality that I've been alluding to up to now. So if you think about it, all of the physiologic and anatomic changes that occur with age reflect the continuous renovation of tissues in our body, which is driven by a reservoir of stem cells that are there to basically replace and, uh, and renew our cells and tissues as we age. It's one of the reasons why during our youth, um, we, we can maintain a very rapid response to injury with a very, very complete and high quality repair process. And the proliferation and differentiation of, of, of stem cells in different tissues drives this process and we now have evidence that we can, we can augment or replace that process uh, by uh, by delivering stem cells from a, a universal donor source like the placenta, or if you're fortunate enough to have your own stem cells, just pull them out of the cryopreservation tank and use them. So in my, in my um, uh, most recent uh, interests, the opportunity to preserve human performance as we age, maintaining high-performance mobility, cognition, and maintaining youthful aesthetics. And believe it or not, aesthetics has a big, big uh, uh, impact in, in overall human performance. Um, we can, we can put, put quality back into those added years, as well as maintain uh, humans in the productive part of, uh, of the workforce. And this is a concept we call recharging the regenerative engine. So if, uh, if you think of it this way, if you think that, that we all have within us that almost uh, uh, salamander-like ability for infinite regeneration. We just need to maintain the reservoir that drives that. And that regenerative engine that does all that um, is something that we, we, we can help maintain by maintaining the, uh, the quality of our, of our system, uh, avoiding um, using antioxidant therapies, uh, high quality nutrition, avoiding uh, exposure to different uh, sources of injury like radiation, uh, viruses, chemicals, and so on and so forth. But when that doesn't work, being able to pull stem cells out of the deep freeze and administer them as easily as through an intravenous infusion might be the most effective, cost-effective, and an efficient way to recharge that engine and maintain the quality of life as we age. So in our world of cellular medicine, we're, we're working to deliver a real paradigm shift in the way we treat cancer, inflammatory diseases, and, and, and more recently, our interest in age-related diseases because the tool at our disposal is so abundant, so versatile, and so economical. And um, uh, I, will, I will close by saying that this is just the tip of the iceberg. The, um, I was talking to Ken before, uh, before our presentations, and one of the concepts that I think may excite all of us is that if you think that a stem cell is a delivery system for a, um, for a set of genes that, um, that can be identified and interrogated using... Uh, genomic technologies, and then coupled with artificial intel intelligence and machine learning. We're going to find the ability to select cell therapy products that can be delivered in order to confer very specific genetic traits. So let me give you one example and leave you with this. 
you know what hybrid vigor is? Hybrid vigor is the fact that, that the, parental, the parental lineage, when combined, their unique genetic traits recombine in the offspring in order to provide a selective advantage for that offspring. Well, that type of vigor occurs uh, between generations. There's, a, there's something called chimerism, where a single organism can carry more than one genome. We know in agriculture, that's the best way to create enhanced disease resistance and enhanced virility and production. So in, for example, every, every fruit you buy in the store, or well, the vast majority of fruits, come from chimeric trees, where they actually graft branches from different trees onto one another in order to confer that disease resistance and, and uh, versatility. Well, chimerism can exist in human beings as well. And I'll give you one, one example. Um, about 3 to 4% of the human population is naturally HIV resistant. They do not express a molecule called CCR5, which is the docking molecule on lymphocytes upon which the HIV virus actually binds and infects the cell. If you don't have that molecule, you can't be infected. Well, I don't know if many of you are aware, but there are now multiple cases and multiple examples of how a patient who is a natural HIV-resistant patient, because they don't express that molecule, their stem cells, when transplanted into an HIV-positive patient, can confer HIV negativity back to that patient. So that's an example of therapeutic chimerism. If, if, the, if the key to that is having stem cells with a vast array of genetic traits, and we have the tools that Ken's developing to interrogate those genomics and select the products that can confer the therapeutic advantage to your patient, that means that in the future, we may all wind up walking around as microchimeras, having greater disease resistance and, and improved quality of life because of those genetic traits. I would say that in the, in, in the next five to 10 years, Cell therapy is going to become a cornerstone of managing all of the life-shortening uh, uh, causes of premature death, cancer, um, chronic immune disease, uh, and serious untreatable infectious diseases. The ability to take stem cells and interrogate their genome, as the, as the genomics world begins to complete their work in annotating the genome and identifying how, how specific genes and array of genes are associated with biological traits. I'm going to bug Ken over here to help me develop the tools to interrogate those and then select the products that will fit an individual who just had their genome read, not by 23andMe necessarily, but by some other enterprise, who demonstrate that that individual is at risk for a disease because of an underlying limitation in their own genomics. If I can now add the right array that gives them that disease resistance, that'll be a, t a tool we use. And I, I say that's going to happen in the next 10 years. All right. Thank you. All right.